Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany, a podcast where we talk about biohacking in an affordable and accessible way for everybody, especially young folk who are new to it. Today, we have Pamela Gold on the podcast. She is awesome. We had a great chat. She is the founder of a place called Hacked Fitness in New York City. It is the first biohacking fitness studio of its kind. And it has really new technologies like the ARX machine and a machine called Carol, which is like a stationary bike for high intensity interval training. And we basically just dive into fitness and talk about how to work out in the least amount of time and get the best results possible for your body, for your strength, for your flexibility and all these different markers that you can measure. We also talk about recovery, active recovery versus rest, and we talk about yoga and breath and meditation. So it's a great episode for everybody who is just new to fitness or is just looking for new techniques to do it in a smarter way. So let me know what you think of this episode and enjoy. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today because not only do you have so much experience with biohacking, but you also opened the first biohacking fitness studio in New York City called Hacked Fitness. So I would love for you to just dive into that whole journey of like why you did that and how it came about and all about it. Sure. So it really was just such an organic passion how it all happened because I had listened to a podcast probably about two years ago now where it was the first time that like biohacking, like I definitely heard the term and it was something that was in my sphere, but it hadn't really bubbled up kind of the front of my mind or the front of my consciousness until this podcast where this guy, Lorenzo Delano, was talking to Vishen Lakiani, who's the CEO of Mind Valley, And they were talking about this program called 10X Your Fitness. And so it was in the context of fitness, working out, that they were talking about um, getting much, much better results and much less time kind of hacking you know, the body. And I had a lot of questions about that. I was a personal trainer and super passionate about fitness, but I actually reached out to Lorenzo and ended up getting him to coach me for a little while. And, and that's when I kind of started going down the rabbit hole. And I, I circled back growing up, I, not growing up, but in college, I was a microbiology biochem major for a couple of years and super into the hard sciences. And so it just kind of like connected all these dots. And then I got really, really into it and started using some of this equipment one of which is the ARX, which stands for Adaptive Resistance Exercise. And no one in New York had the new versions of the machines. And I got to use them at a Mind Valley event last February, so like a year and a half, almost two years ago now. Once I used the new version of that machine, I was just like so blown away by how effective it was. It's like, I just want to use this stuff. So I think I'm going to open up a gym and then what's all the other great equipment I can add in to really offer the most robust, you know, biohacking offering that we're lucky enough to have at our disposal these days because there's so much stuff that's so effective and no one in New York City was doing it. I was just like, what is going on? So it was just really like my own passion that made me, I guess, bite the bullet and take the plunge (laughs) and open up a business. That's awesome. I love that. Those are honestly some of the best businesses that come about is like through passion like that. Uh, well, I would hope too, because it's not for the faint of heart. You know, New York City rent, payroll, like every month when it's time to pay rent and pay payroll, it's a like big breath in, big breath out. It's a lot. Oh, I can, I can see that. So I know you talk about like minimum effective dose of exercise, which is obviously related to like the technology that you have access to at your center. So like, what does that look like? So, I mean, yes, we were really lucky at Hacked to have access to a couple pieces of equipment. On the strength side, we have the ARX, like we talked about, and that utilizes the body by science, um, Doug McGruff, McGuff, McGruff, I always mess that up, forgive me, but his principle is about the slow and heavy workout. And so you go as slow, about 10 seconds in each direction with super, super heavy weights. The ARX allows us to do that in this computerized adaptive way. So we don't have to like choose what our, you know, 85% of one rep max is. The computer allows us to just kind of work with the machine and against the machine and get maxed out. So we're able to get a really, really effective, intense, and safe workout by being maxed out both on the eccentric, the lowering phase, and the concentric. If I were to try to recreate that in the gym like I was before I had access to the ARX, 
I wouldn't be able to get all that extra work done on the eccentric because if I were lifting and lowering weights, I would have to choose the weight that I could both lift and lower. Even though I could lower maybe three times as much, I couldn't lift it back up. And so I was limited in that regard with weights. So the ARX just really, really raises the bar on what we're able to accomplish using this effective minimum dose of exercise approach. But even if you don't have access to ARX, you can do that with weights. You can do that just you don't get as much of, of kind of that adaptive, really, really kind of high level response that you get with ARX, but you can do it at home too, you know, with a regular strength training workout machine, you know, weights, that kind of thing. So that's on the strength side. And then on the cardio side, we're lucky to have these bikes called the CAROL and CAROL stands for Cardio Optimized Logic. It uses artificial intelligence and advanced algorithm with advanced biofeedback to basically take your fitness level, plug it into the algorithm, and then give you the perfect resistance in two 20-second sprints, which utilizes something called the Wingate Sprint Protocol, which basically has been shown to get you to glycogen depletion twice in those two you know, 20-second sprints. And in under nine minutes, you get the equivalent of a 45-minute jog. So it's you know the high-intensity interval. We've Probably most of us know that that is a more effective way to work out. But there is this really, really precise interval, if you can really get maxed out in that 20 second period, which most of us won't let ourselves do, which is why having artificial intelligence force us to have the right resistance is much more effective than doing it ourselves. But again, even if you don't have access to this Carol bike, you can try to do it on an assault bike, which is my next favorite piece of equipment that's you know analog. <laughs> or you can you can try to recreate it on a regular bike, just tweaking the resistance. But it's you know, it's just like how can we use the latest science and then in, in our case it hacked the latest pieces of equipment to really, really give us this effective minimum dose. And so that's the strength in the cardio. And then we can talk more about you know power. We don't have anything at Hacked right now that gives us an effective minimum dose of power. I do that on my own. You know, the plyo, you know, I, I jump and I do all the things that I do because I'm strange like that. I'm like a very active mom and I play with my kids. But at Hacked, we focus on the strength and the cardio and then the recovery, which is the other integral part of leveling up our fitness level that most of us don't pay enough attention to. Yeah. That's amazing. I, I've never heard it described like that. It sounds like just such unique technology that really lets you do the best that you can actually do in the best time, which is amazing. Like, which is what I want to do. <laughs> but like, obviously, you know, it's hard to have access to it currently and it's also not affordable, right? So with the current like gym fitness world and this new biohacking fitness world, do you like what do you predict for the future in the next five, 10 years? Well, I really think that this is the future just because it is so effective and more and more facilities will be opening up with this equipment because it's just so next level. And then you have all the data. And so it, when you ask most people what stands in the way of, of them you know, getting their workouts in, most people say time, motivation, and accountability. Equipment like this, where it's much more efficient, you know, if I tell you, you only need to do two 20 second sprints and it'll be less than nine minutes. And that's all you have to do for cardio. That really lowers the bar in terms of excuses around time. When it comes to motivation and accountability, when you have all this data that can show you how effective the results are and how your body is changing, really, really helps with motivation and accountability as well. Because especially in a gym like ours, you have to set an appointment and you have someone there with you. But if you have an app that's pinging you and, and telling you, hey, it's been two days, go do your workout, you know, all this stuff, it really, really addresses the main issues that people have keeping them from achieving fitness pretty cool. No, I think you're right. I think it'll be very integrated in the future. But for now, like obviously because it's just so new, what can we do right now to get the same results? I mean, I don't really want to be running on a treadmill and like have a book with me and write down my times and my sprints and all of this stuff. Like I know it probably does work like that, but like I just don't know how many people would actually do that. So before I had access to this equipment, and there was about a year and a half period where I didn't have access to the latest ARX and I didn't have access to the Carol, what I was using on the cardio side was the assault bike. I mentioned it a minute ago. I don't know if you are familiar with that. There's a couple different you know, brands and names. Basically, it's the bike that has the arms and then the fan as the front wheel. Have you ever seen those? 
Yes. You basically, yeah. as you go harder, the resistance gets harder. So it's kind of an adaptive resistance machine in an analog way, right? It's not the AI that's doing it. But I used to use that machine and then I used it the calorie counter to hold me accountable and to keep me leveling up. It wasn't an accurate calorie counter because you know, I'm 118 you know, pounds person versus someone who's 190 pounds. Obviously, a calorie is not going to be a calorie when it comes to work for people that are very different sized. So I don't recommend using a calorie counter to really try to count calories, but you can use it to hold yourself accountable for the amount of work that you're doing in a certain amount of time. And so if we're going to do this Wingate sprint protocol, which when I use it on the Carol, I do 20 seconds. If I did it on an assault bike, I would increase it to 30 seconds because I really want to make sure I get depleted. And when I'm doing it myself, I'm more likely to hold back just because our brain is wired for survival. So our brain is wired to tell us that we have to stop well before we actually have to. So it's like, it keeps us safe, but it also keeps us from really thriving. So because of that, if I'm doing it analog, I put an extra 10 seconds on the sprint. And then I do my best and I see how many calories I burn in that time. And then I'll take my you know, recovery. It'll be like a three minute or two minute recovery. And we should feel really awful. After that 30 seconds, we should feel like a wave wash over us of just like, I feel like I may die. <laughs> Nothing as horrible as that sounds, but that, that glycogen depletion feeling is not a good feeling. So you kind of want to lean into that discomfort and tell yourself that you're fine and then do it again. So three minutes of recovery and then do another 20 seconds and you can watch your calorie counter and see where you start and where you finish. And then you have your benchmark. And then every two days when you do it again, try to do at least that, if not better, and then trust the process. You don't have access to, on Carol, they give you a, a an octane score, which is a rough equivalent of a VO2 max. And you can see how that gets better over time, but you can use the calorie counter to see how that gets better over time. And so you can do that type of workout really with any piece of equipment. The assault bike is my favorite because of the adaptive resistance piece, but you could do it on an elliptical. You could do it on a spin bike if you increase the resistance during the sprints. So there's a lot of different ways to be creative and use what you have to use this high intensity interval protocol. Even just being on an elliptical and for 30 seconds going as hard as you absolutely can. And then for 60 seconds or, or you know, 120 seconds, just recover and go slow and, and feel better and then do it again as hard as you can. And then maybe do that four times if you're doing it just without like any intense resistance and you're just kind of getting depleted. Maybe do it four times to make sure that you really you know, get that full glycogen depletion that you would get, you know, in the carol with the 20 seconds. But you can start to, to experiment with this with just about any piece of equipment. And then, you know, one day, hopefully you'll have access to some of the equipment that, that bakes in the AI and all that fun stuff. But there's a lot of ways to achieve this with whatever equipment you have. That's the cardio side, at least. Let me yeah. tell you about swimming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can explain. This is all stuff I was doing is I didn't used to have access to the ARX either. And my first step was when I heard this protocol, and this is, you can also sign up for the Mind Valley 10X course. They actually do live programs. I think there's an online course coming out uh, in the fall. But basically, I hired one of my trainer friends to help me at the gym to try to figure out what my 80% one rep max was. And I wanted to have a trainer help me because I wanted to make sure I had good form. I wanted to make sure I stayed safe. And so my trainer helped me identify for the big five, the chest press, row, pull down, overhead press, and leg press, what my 80% max one rep number was. And then my goal was using that amount of weight to go for a minute and 30 seconds to a minute and 45 seconds, moving super, super slow, trying to get as much of a full range of motion as possible. But at some point, usually it ended up being a static hold <laughs> with me like crying and then stop. And then, you know, week over week, month over month, obviously the goal is to increase the weight, be able to increase the time, but at some point you do plateau where you won't necessarily be increasing the weight or the time, but you'll continue to see your body change. And that is why we're doing all this is to really be as healthy as possible, have more muscle mass, see our body be you know, as healthy and fit as possible. It's pretty interesting how quickly the body adapts to mm -hmm. the changes that you make. So if I take a week or two off of working out in general, like if I'm traveling or whatever I'm doing, and then I come back, there's a couple things I notice. One, I am actually pretty strong, which is surprising, but I think it's because I've rested for so long. I can actually lift more weight than I thought I would be able to after taking time off. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, is like with HIT and cardio, 
I definitely lose stamina. But then within that first week back, mm-hmm. say I'm doing hit like every other day, by the time it's the third or the fourth time that week, mm-hmm. I'm already like moving up really, really fast. And it's crazy. Like what you run at on a Monday and what you run at maybe the week after is like so different. And you're like, how was I only doing this last week? And it's crazy. It's so cool. I mean, it's so inspiring to me how adaptive and powerful the body is because you're, you're echoing the same experience that I've always had. And originally when I got really fit, I used to be in a a scarcity mindset and be afraid when I had to take time off because I wasn't yet kind of the whole healthy person that I am now. And I remember thinking, oh man, I got to go on this vacation with my kids for two weeks and I'm not going to be able to do my normal workouts and I'm not going to be able to do all this. And there was always that dread. And then absolutely universally, like never was there a time that when I came back, okay, yeah, the first workout or two was not pleasant, no, no question, but then I always leveled up. And it keeps you from plateauing, taking breaks. Mm -hmm. So for us to embrace this consistent inconsistency and trust that it's all part of the ebb and flow and that our body really is so powerful and so adaptive. And even though you lose, kind of think, I think of it like the surface, you lose kind of some of the surface, the shallow results in that short period of time, but on a deeper, more rooted foundational level, you actually have shored up and you're coming from a much stronger foundation after you've taken that time off and the body does respond so quickly and changes so quickly. It's so cool. Yeah, it is. So how much recovery do you recommend on the average week? Like not vacation, just like the average week. Yeah. So, I mean, it's such a personalized thing. Mm -hmm. That's why you know, keeping our HRV in the front of our minds, keeping our sleep in the front of our minds, have as much like real information as possible in the front of our minds and trusting that because any given week, so much is going on in our environment. You know, we could be fighting something off. There could be extra stress in our family or at work or personally, whatever. We could be exposed to more toxins, you know, physical toxins, emotional, spiritual toxins. And so it really is so dependent on what's going on. I think a general rule of thumb is that if all things are equal and you're a completely average person, you know, you want to prioritize a good, like, you know, I say hours of recovery in between, you know, your activities and in between those hard workouts. At the end of the day, if you're really doing a hard, hard ARX workout, most people need four to seven days off from real intense work, or you're not going to be getting the real results from it. If you're not doing something that hard, then obviously you're not going to need as much recovery. So all this stuff, you know, the long story short is it really depends. And that's something that when you come to HACT, I try to teach everyone to listen to their own biology and all the data that we have access to and what our body's telling us, because it's such an individualized thing. And I want people to really learn to listen to their bodies because you'll know what your body's saying more than any kind of on average, you know, like yeah. what the real, what the real answer is, you know? Yeah. It's been very hard to learn and accept that recovery is needed. Mm-hmm. Well, we're, we're kind of raised in that, you know, scarcity mindset yeah. around laziness, you know, and we were taught these really awesome mantras, you know, like, take action every day you know, towards your dreams, which are great. It's just when it comes to our bodies and our biology, we really need to honor the full spectrum of both phases, You know, the catabolic and the anabolic. The catabolic is when we break down our body, we're actually you know, doing the micro tears and stressing our body out when we work out. And then we have to give it the resources, time, nutrition, sleep, all that stuff, biochemicals to repair and recover and be stronger. Otherwise, what's the point of working out? We could be undermining our health and actually lowering our fitness level if we don't honor that cycle. Yeah, exactly. So do you think that active recovery is okay or do you think that we should recover and actually not be very active at all? I think active recovery is great. I think that the research that I've seen moving your body in a gentle way, you know, like walking, yoga, dancing, 
I love to dance. So <laughs> it's never a bad idea to dance, my friends. So I definitely think that active recovery is is awesome. I think being active is super, super necessary for our bodies. I think all the research has been so clear that literally we need to be moving all day long. It's not like I went to the gym an hour, you know, and then I can be sedentary the whole rest of the day. It doesn't work like that. We need to keep moving our bodies, being in our bodies, feeling our bodies, you know, rolling our shoulders, stretching our necks, moving our, like, you know, when you're sitting in the chair, just to like arch your back and stretch and move doing it right now. You know, all of that I consider active recovery and it's super, super important. You know, and even getting a massage, if you think about what's happening when you're getting a massage, you're moving the muscles. The muscles are being moved for you, but it's all of that flushing out. It's so good for the body. It's just you're not straining. You know, like moving in a gentle way is awesome. Straining when you're trying to recover is not. I agree. I like walking throughout the day and yoga even and stretching for active recovery helps a lot. And I do foam rolling, massages. Yeah, foam rolling. So exactly. And it doesn't have to be like you don't have to leave the house. Like you could just watch Netflix and foam roll, but you're still doing something. You know what I mean? Like it yeah, still yeah, makes a difference. Stretching, like just yeah moving. I mean, there's so many, I mean, I, I, one of the things I studied was teacher training for yoga and that was so helpful. Not that I teach yoga really very often, but just remembering, you know, being connected with my body and feeling my body move and stretching and, oh, it's so good being present in your body and honoring that it feels so good to move it. It feels so good to touch it, to move it. It's all good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. What I like about yoga is the element of like active meditation that it kind of mm-hmm. has. Yeah. And I'm not one to meditate very well. Like it's this it's the same thing with recovery, right? Like doing anything that's very calming is it's hard for me to accept it because you I automatically think like this is a waste of time and I could be doing something more active. So the the active meditation part of yoga is something that I actually really enjoy with yeah, it. And I, I can speak to that too because I was definitely like that. I really remember really, really well after I had my second little one and I was going to the gym regularly because I had a lot of weight to lose. I remember going to a yoga class and I literally only had an hour when I had a babysitter to get out of my house. And I was you know, like downward dog and then warrior. And I was like, this is torture. I only have an hour. I need to be moving. I need to be kicking. I need to be sweating. This is not good enough, right? All that judgment around enough. Mm-hmm. And it took a long time and a lot of patience for me and, and I had one really good friend who was getting private yoga instruction in her apartment and she kept making me go. And then she dragged me to a yoga class and there was a lot of synchronicity where this yoga teacher read from a book that I hadn't thought of or read since I was 20 and I'm 40 something now. So even though this was a few years ago, it had been probably 15 years since this book had even been in my mind. And so she read a passage from this book and this book was like this magical, mystical book that had fallen off the shelf bookstore in Denver, Colorado. And I'll never forget it because it was the first book on Buddhism and meditation that I had ever been exposed to. And it really changed the trajectory, like opened up a lot of ideas and paths that I hadn't ever been exposed to before. And so when I went to this yoga class and this woman, this teacher starts reading from the book, I was like, oh my God, it's a sign. (laughs) And so I started going to the yoga class and sticking with it, even though it was like really out of my comfort zone to have to be so still. But after I go to class, I felt so good. And I was like, there's like something to this. And so I made myself commit to it for three weeks. And after those three weeks, I was sold. I was like, this is There's something about this that is opening a source of power in me. This this getting out of my comfort zone in the stillness was was just transformative because it wasn't something that I ever I was never wired to do that. I never felt safe enough to be still, to be quiet. It was just like, why would one do that? There's things to do. We're trying to get ahead. We're trying to get better. We're trying to grow. Like sitting still seems like the opposite pursuit, not realizing that there is infinite more peace or infinite more power in peace than we'll ever find in any activity. And it's totally counter reason and counter anything that we experience in the solid world. But once I started to meditate and have an active meditation practice, 
my entire life changed. Like hacked wouldn't exist if it weren't for my meditation practice and the spiritual awakening I had a bunch of years ago. So I used to think that meditation was not for me, just like some people like to swim for exercise and that just is not me. Don't make me get wet pool. (laughs) But meditation I thought was that. And then once I committed to a practice and I started small, just like one minute meditations and then two minute meditations. And I would notice how I felt afterwards and notice how good I felt and five minute meditation. And then ultimately up to 18 minutes and changed my life. That seems to be the same story or very similar to most people who try meditation is like they just start small and then they build on it and then they couldn't even imagine life without it because it's so reflective and it's so calming for the nervous system and and it's just like so different from the go, go, go of the world, of the corporate world, of the entrepreneurial world, whatever you're doing, that it's really a breath of fresh air. So yeah, well, it's the source of so much power. Mm-hmm. It's the source of so much bravery. It's the source of so much clarity, so much wisdom, so much inspiration. It's just, it's so funny. It's like, it's almost like if you were a tree and you didn't realize you had roots. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> yeah. I'm just up here. <laughs> I'm like, you don't realize that you've got this whole root system that's the source of your stability and source of your nutrients and the source of, of everything that you need to survive. And you just don't know that it's there under the ground because you don't ever look under the ground. But then when you start to sit quietly, it allows you to go under the ground and tap into those roots. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is like, how did I, what? This is, oh my yeah. God. <laughs> yeah, I love that. So for people who don't meditate and want to start and know about the benefits and they always hear about it, do you have any recommendations or advice for them? Totally. I'm literally just Google one minute meditation and see what picture or what link calls to you and just click on it. And if that one doesn't do anything for you, try another one. It's one of those things. It's like, just keep looking for a teacher or a practice that sticks and just don't stop looking because you're going to find someone who resonates with you. You're going to find someone that even though a million other people had told you the same thing, suddenly when they say it, you feel it resonate in a way that's different. And then when you do the practice, you'll feel much different results from it. And so just trust that. It's almost like having a metal detector and being on the beach and just kind of you know, just keep looking, you know, just keep running the metal detector all over until it beeps, you know? <laughs> yeah. Because that really is the way with spiritual teachers and meditation really is a spiritual practice that, you know, suddenly you'll, you'll just hear someone and there's just something about their voice or something about their look or just something about that time and place that you feel called to click and you click and that'll be your person. So just trust it and don't stop seeking until you find it. So what does your meditation practice look like right now? Mm. So it has evolved over time. Have you ever heard of Yogananda, Autobiography of a Yogi? No, I haven't. Well, it's a book that Steve Jobs said changed his life. And it's the one book he said was on his nightstand his entire life. And at his funeral, everyone was given a copy. When I heard all that, I was like, I probably should read that book. <laughs> yeah. So I read that book and I'd already been meditating for a little while. And so the thing about that book, if I had read it, earlier, I think in my meditative or spiritual or yogi kind of life, I would have just kind of been like, what? This is just all nuts. There's no way that any of this could be real. Almost like I would have read it like a fairy tale. But because I had already started meditating when I went to yoga school, I studied with someone named Alan Finger and his stuff is on Spotify. So if you're just like, huh, I want to start somewhere, you can look on Spotify or iTunes. His name is Alan Finger, A-L-A-N, and then finger like your hand. And he has a bunch of meditations. My favorite is Sat Yam. I can give you this so you can put it in the show notes. But that's what the meditation that I had been doing and it was awesome. But then when I read Autobiography of a Yogi, there was just so much magical, mystical stuff in that. I was like, I want to learn that kind of meditation. Because he talked a little bit about this particular technique called Kriya. And so I found a Kriya teacher in New York City to teach me these really simple techniques. And that was about three years ago now. And so the first time I sat with him, really simple. You just kind of follow your breath, really simple things, nothing weird. And it was like, holy cow, just huge you know, experience of something very different, energetically, light, sound, things just like, what? (laughs) What was that? It was really good. And so I've been meditating that technique for 
about three years now and I do that pretty much every day and now I kind of meditate all day every day when I'm walking around because once that pathway starts to get open then the practice is to keep it open and be in that place all day and be in that flow all day so you can be in touch with your highest level of wisdom and creativity and bravery and love all day wow that's a really impressive. <laughs> I definitely want to read that book and I'm going to look up Alan Finger on Spotify for sure. Because yeah. I find with meditation, it's easier to stick to it for myself if it's a guided meditation. Sure. Or there's something a bit more to it than just maybe music or just doing it by myself. Then yeah. it's like you said, the accountability and there's someone there guiding you. So it's... Insight Timer is really good. That's another great resource because if you go on Insight Timer, there's tons and tons and tons of guided meditations. You can just keep trying them. There's no such thing as a bad meditation. We tend to be very judgmental because that's how our brain is wired about how successful or how bad a meditation was because your brain was just so active. And a lot of us think that meditation is about trying to get your mind to be quiet. And that's really not the case because the mind doesn't really ever get quiet. It's kind of like if you had a dog that you've been feeding table scraps at the table all these years and you suddenly stopped feeding it table scraps, it wouldn't stop begging and whining and being at the table. But after enough time of not giving it the table scraps, it would settle down a little bit. It'll never stop because it's a dog. <laughs> and that's kind of like how our mind is. It's our attention and what we pay attention to that is the secret sauce. That's like feeding the table scraps. So when our mind has thoughts and we notice that we are now giving our attention to those thoughts, it's the practice of bringing our attention back to the meditation, whatever we decided, if it's a mantra or if it's a guided whatever, or if it's our breath, if it's a light, whatever it is that we're bringing our attention to, it's that practice of bringing our attention back, bringing our attention back, bringing our attention back. That's actually strengthening that mindfulness muscle that then will start to unlock this higher level of meditation, which is when we're able to keep our attention in one place effortlessly. At first, for many years, it was a lot of effort to keep my attention in one place. <laughs> it was like a puppy. But then eventually I kept remembering, in yoga they taught us that the first you know, step is when it takes a lot of effort, but then we're going to this place where it's effortless to just stay in that one place with our attention. And that's when things start to open up and get really, really good. Yeah. I find with meditating, it allows me to be more present kind of like mm -hmm. what you're saying. Yeah. And when you're more present, it automatically reduces anxiety, reduces depression if you're dealing with those things. Mm -hmm. So it helps with that. But then it's also, I notice if I'm actually sticking to it for a while, it's kind of like what you said, it just calms me down a bit and I'm less reactive to things that happen day to day, even mm -hmm when I'm not meditating. So it creates this time and space between something mm -hmm. happening and my emotional reaction to it. Exactly. Yeah, it sounds really trippy and like weird. If it's you, like a superpower. It really yeah. feels like in the moment because one of the analogies I, I use to describe exactly what you're describing is like if you imagine you had a glass of, of water and then on top of the glass, if you had like, you know, a, a piece of, you know, wood or something, and you drop a marble and it just hits the wood and bounces right off. It's like, that's, that's what most of us, before we have a mindfulness practice and meditation helps us become more mindful. But when we're talking about being present and being aware of what we're paying attention to, that's mindfulness. That's the definition of mindfulness, like being aware of your attention. And so when we don't have a mindfulness practice, you drop the marble, it hits the wood, it bounces right back off. And so maybe that's us getting angry that someone bumped into us or you know, getting sad about this or feeling anxious about whether or not something's going to happen when we had like a thought about it. When, when you have a mindfulness practice and a meditation practice, it's like you take away that piece of wood on top of the glass and then you drop the marble. But now instead of like ricocheting right off, it hits the water and just kind of slowly floats down. And so now you have all this time <laughs> to decide, oh, isn't that interesting? What am I going to do with the marble? <laughs> Whereas before there was no time, it was just like, bam, bam. And now you're like, oh, that's so interesting. I'm starting to feel myself get angry. Why is it that I'm angry? Is it appropriate for me to be angry? Is it going to help the situation for me to be angry? Is it even about this present moment situation that I'm angry? <laughs> and you're like, hmm, isn't that interesting? And then, then you're like, well, that's weird. I didn't used to have all these thoughts and awareness around my anger before. I would have just already <laughs> told them that they're a bitch. And <laughs> I know, this is going to be uh, strange. So yeah, I mean, all of that, yeah. it, it makes us better humans. Because we're going to get triggered. We're going to have fear. We're going to have feelings, emotional triggers around all the things that are happening. And half the time, 
it doesn't even have anything to do with that present moment. And if we have a mindfulness presence, you know, practice, and we have that presence, we can evaluate that and then decide what the next constructive way to handle the situation is. And we'll be that much more effective. We'll be able to diffuse, disarm, navigate, stay true to our values, stay on course, get better results from our life. It's good stuff. It is. It is. And it's actually quite addictive once you get you know, into a meditation practice because it just has that sense of release and relief that comes with it that feels oh, yeah. so good. I told my sons, I have a 13-year-old and a 10-year-old, and so I was telling my sons, we were to have, had the whole big like drugs talk. Mm-hmm. And when I was younger, full disclosure, I definitely experimented with just about everything under the sun because that's <laughs> how I am. And, and my son, you know, was talking about, you know, he was curious and we were talking about all that. And what I said to him was, I really hope that you experiment with meditation before you decide you want to experiment with drugs. Because if I had known then what I know now, I would have skipped a lot of risk, a lot of unhealthy choices because meditation really unlocked everything that I was seeking with all of the substances I was experimenting with, you know, just just wanting to feel better, you know, wanting to feel at peace, wanting to feel safe, wanting to feel happy, wanting, wanting to feel excited, wanting to feel alive, right? Whether I was like avoiding something or wanting more of something, meditation is like the healthy answer to all of that stuff. And it's so much more effective than drugs and the results <laughs> will enhance your life as opposed to mess up your life. Yeah. Yeah. There's no come down from meditation. No, usually it just gets better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I feel like I just learned so much from you and you're also so easy to talk to. Is there anything that you would like to leave our listeners with that it has to do with meditation and exercise like we talked about that's easy for them to implement today? Well, I think, you know, we talked about finding that meditation, you know, going on either Insight Timer or Spotify and making a commitment. I'm a big fan of commitment and acceptance therapy where it's like, all right, here I am now and this is the commitment I'm going to make for myself. But to make a commitment to yourself, say, you know what, I'm going to try this for three weeks. For three weeks, I'm going to put it in my calendar and I'm going to commit to myself that I'm going to do it every day. And we're talking like start with one minute, start with two minutes, five minutes. I mean, we can always find a few minutes to meditate. So I would encourage you to make a commitment and stick with it and notice how you feel. And that would be it. Yeah. A minute a day is definitely doable. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. I think And then a go-to when you're starting to be like, wow, you know, to like be like, great, I'm going to do my one minute meditation right now instead of like freaking out and just see how I feel. Remember to breathe. And then they'll have so much more spaciousness around whatever the crisis is. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Well, thank you so much. I will put everything that you mentioned into the show notes and link to Hacked Fitness for anybody in New York City. And I actually really want to come there at one point. I yeah, will. <laughs> come play. You have a lot of fun. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this episode. Everything is linked below, all about Pamela's fitness studio, Hacked, also about the different books that we mentioned and the apps, and my website, Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. Please let me know what you think of this episode. You can either leave an iTunes review or you can shoot me a message on Instagram. I respond to everybody within time, within a reasonable amount of time lately. So yeah, let me know what you think. And thanks for listening and tune in every week for a new episode when we explore affordable and accessible biohacks with some of the coolest biohackers out there in the world and health experts right now. Thanks. Thanks.